It's a great pleasure to welcome Catherine. Uh, she'll be familiar to many of you here, uh, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with her books. She has written many books on 14th century history, uh, including the biographies of Edward II, Isabella of France, uh, Hugh Dispenser the Younger, and Philippa of Haino. So who better to talk about the mysterious fate of Edward II? Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, Philip, you've got my notes. <laughs> got my notes. <laughs> <clears throat> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for that warm welcome. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. So I'm here today to talk to you about an intriguing historical mystery. Was a king murdered in 1327, or did he perhaps live on for years past that date? I'd like to show you the evidence for both sides. There's really no doubt that Edward II, who succeeded his father, Edward I, in July 1307, is one of England's most unsuccessful kings in history, and his disastrous reign came to an end in January 1327, when he was forced to abdicate his throne to his 14-year-old son, Edward III. During the young king's minority, his kingdom was ruled by his mother, Isabella of France, Edward II's wife, and her close ally, Roger Mortimer of Wigmore, who became the first Earl of March in late 1328. Isabella and Roger had led an invasion of England in September 1326 and ended up bringing about Edward II's downfall after they executed his favourite Chamberlain and virtual co-ruler of the previous few years, Hugh Spencer the Younger, Lord of Glamorgan. Although the deposition or forced abdication of English kings later became reasonably common, in 1327, it was unprecedented and revolutionary, and nobody really knew how they could achieve it. So I often get the sense in, late, in the early 1327 that people were slowly groping their way towards trying to find a solution to the problem of Edward II. And no one quite knew either what to do with, with the former king who was still alive in the reign of his successor, because this had never happened before. So at first, Edward II, who was now merely Sir Edward of Carnarvon, uh, his birthplace in, in Wales, and throughout the talk I'll refer to him both as Edward II and, and Edward of Carnarvon, uh, was held at Kenilworth Castle in Warwickshire in the custody of his cousin, Henry of Lancaster, Earl of Lancaster and Leicester. In early April 1327... Sorry. Sorry, I'm just trying to show you a picture of Barclay Castle and it's not... Moving for, oh, there we go. So, sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. In early April 1327, Edward was transferred to Barclay Castle in Gloucestershire, which is about halfway between Gloucester and Bristol, and was put in the care of Thomas, Lord Barclay, who was Roger Mortimer's son-in-law, the husband of Roger's eldest daughter, Margaret. Lord Barclay's brother-in-law, Sir John Maltravers of Dorset, was appointed as the former king's joint custodian, and another knight from Somerset, called Sir Thomas Gurney, was also involved. Despite what you may have heard or read, there is every reason to believe that Edward II was well treated while he was in captivity at Barclay Castle. The tales of his mistreatment, which are still often repeated today, for example, that he was deliberately kept in a small cell near animal carcasses in the hope that the, the stench would, uh, would suffocate him to death, were invented several decades later by a chronicler called Geoffrey Le Baker. Baker wished to promote Edward II's canonization as a saint of all the horrendously unlikely things. So invented stories of how Edward had patiently and nobly suffered the torments inflicted on him by lesser men, the satraps of Satan, as Baker memorably called them. But uh, we do have good reason to believe that Edward received good food and wine while he was at Barclay. And while, of course, he wasn't free to leave, it does seem that he had servants looking after him. And at first, Edward of Carnarvon's whereabouts were deliberately kept secret. His followers had been taken by surprise by the speed of his downfall in late 1326 and early 1327, but they soon regrouped. And in 1327, there were four plots to free Edward from captivity that, that I know of. Uh, the first one took place at Kenilworth Castle when he was still held there earlier in the year. And in July 1327, 
A group of followers led by the Dunhevet brothers, Stephen and Thomas from Warwickshire, found out where Edward was being held and attacked Barclay Castle. Rather remarkably, they managed to snatch Edward from Lord Barclay's custody, although I'm not actually sure whether they took him out of the castle altogether or whether they just freed him from the, the cell or the room where he was being held in the castle. But we know about this attack from a letter sent by Lord Barclay himself at the end of July, 1327. Lord Barclay's letter also said that there was another plot in Bedfordshire, Buckinghamshire and Berkshire to free Edward. And a fourth plot also came in September 1327, this one in Wales, led by Sir Rhys ap Griffith and Sir Griffith Lloyd. And when this plot was uncovered, some of the plotters fled north to Scotland, while the rest of them were imprisoned in Carnarvon Castle in North Wales, which ironically enough was Edward II's birthplace. This latest plot obviously convinced some people that the former king was just too dangerous to be kept alive. If Edward II was ever freed from captivity, he might try to claim his throne that he had lost to his son and civil war would ensue. Queen Isabella would be punished, perhaps by being sent to a nunnery, while Roger Mortimer and his allies who had taken part in the downfall of Edward II would be executed, almost certainly by being subjected to the traitor's death of drawing, hanging and quartering. Roger Mortimer was the Justice of Wales in 1327 and his deputy was Sir William Shelford. On the 14th of September 1327, Shelford sent Roger Mortimer a letter informing him of this latest Welsh plot to free Edward and urging him to find a solution to the problem of Edward of Carnarvon before they all died horrible deaths, essentially. So Roger's response was to send a man called William Ockley, a man at arms who was a long-term Mortimer retainer to Barclay Castle. And on the 21st of September, 1327, Edward II was supposedly murdered at Barclay Castle. There's little doubt about the correct date. The 21st of September is the feast day of St. Matthew the Evangelist, and most English chroniclers of the 14th century agree on the date. And we also have a letter from the young King Edward III himself on the matter. In September 1327, Edward III was in Lincoln, where he just held Parliament. He was still only 14 at this point. Uh, born on the 13th of November 1312, the young king hadn't even had his 15th birthday yet. And on the 24th of September, he sent a letter to his cousin, John de Boone, the Earl of Hereford, whose late mother, Isabella, was one of Edward II's sisters. <laughs> Um, so in this letter, Edward III announced to his cousin that news came to us this Wednesday, the 23rd of September, during the night, that our dearest Lord and Father has been commanded to God. So this is Edward III announcing the death of his father, Edward II, to his cousin. And news began to spread across the entire country. And as Edward of Carnarvon was still only 43 in 1327 and had always been a very healthy, strong and fit man, plenty of people must have wondered what had actually happened to him. But no one who was involved in the, affair, in the affair ever spoke about it publicly. And although Edward III began claiming several years later that his father had been murdered, he never explained how his father had been murdered. So chroniclers filled the gap with their own speculation or opinion or with rumours that they'd heard. And chroniclers of the 14th century give numerous pos possible causes of Edward II's death, including but not limited to suffocation, strangulation, illness, grief-induced illness, poison, a fall, natural causes, and so on. Quite a few of them only said that Edward died at Barclay without explaining how he died. And a few decades later, the Scarlet Chronica wrote that Edward died at Barclay by what manner is not known, but God knows it. Later in the 14th century, the story of Edward II's murder by Red Hot Poker became popular, and it's still often repeated today. And in fact, it's usually the only thing that most people think they know about Edward II, but it's pretty well certain that this story isn't true. It was repeated and perpetuated in the Middle Ages for pretty well the same reasons that it's still repeated today, because it's such a gruesome and revoltingly lurid and therefore memorable story. There's a documentary on YouTube, for example, where a popular historian outright says that the red hot poker isn't true. But then he shows a video anyway, where an actor playing Edward II screams in agony as the uh, poker is inserted. Uh, and he shows that not once, but twice. 
So this story is told again and again because it's so gruesome and because it's believed to make a good story, not because it bears any actual resemblance to historical truth. So whatever happened to Edward of Carnarvon in September 1327, the English government apparatus soon sprang into action. Although Edward had died deposed and disgraced, he was, after all, of royal birth, the son of a king, the former king himself, and the father of the reigning king, and he was therefore entitled to an honourable uh, royal burial. Edward wasn't, however, buried in Westminster Abbey alongside his parents, Edward I and Eleanor of Castile and his grandfather, Henry III, but in St. Peter's Abbey in Gloucester, which later became Gloucester Cathedral uh, during the Reformation. Um, so here we see some pictures of Edward II's tomb and effigy in Gloucester Cathedral, and I'm sure that some of you will, uh, will have seen it. And if any of you haven't been to Gloucester Cathedral, I do urge you to, to visit because this tomb is absolutely magnificent. Uh, one of the greatest examples of medieval art that, that we still have. Edward's funeral took place in Gloucester on the 20th of December, 1327, three months after his death, but a long delay between a royal death and a funeral was entirely normal for the royal family in the 14th century. So this delay isn't in itself suspicious. If they'd rushed him into the ground within a week or two after death, that probably would have been suspicious. And a local woman of Barclay, whose name isn't recorded, embalmed Edward's body, and Lord Barclay sent Edward's heart to his wife, Queen Isabella, in a silver casket. And I know that sounds macabre and revolting as well, but separate uh, heart burial was also entirely normal in the royal family in the 13th and 14th centuries. So this isn't suspicious either, and probably not particularly significant. Edward's body remained at Barclay Castle for a month after his death until the 21st of October. And during this time, it was guarded by one man and one man alone, William Beaucaire, a sergeant at arms. Beaucaire is actually a town in the south of France near Avignon. So it would appear that William Beaucaire was French or at least that his father was. And he seems a very odd choice for this job because earlier in 1327, William Beaucaire had been closely associated with some of the men who were then temporarily free Edward of Carnarvon from Barclay Castle in July, 1327. And his background would seem to be token loyalty to Edward II himself rather than to Thomas Barclay or his father-in-law, Roger Mortimer. And another seeming oddity is raised by the chronicler Adam Murimuth, a royal clerk who was the only chronicler in the southwest of England in the autumn of 1327. He was in Exeter. He says that a number of abbots, knights and burgesses from Bristol and Gloucester saw Edward's body, but that they only saw it superficially. And what he meant by that is unclear. And a lot of ink has been spilt on, on the meaning of this statement. And as so often, Murray Muth's statement raises more questions than it answers, like who exactly were these men? Why did they go and see Edward of Carnarvon's body? Did this happen at Barclay Castle or later, after Edward had been moved to Gloucester? Who invited them? Did they all go together in one large group or in small groups or individually? You see, we just don't know the answers to any of these questions, though we can be fairly sure that at least some of the men would have seen Edward II in person during his reign and would have known what he looked like. However, as Ian Mortimer has pointed out in his work on Edward II's death, royal embalming of the 14th century involved covering the face entirely with wax impregnated cloth. So whether these men actually had the, ch the chance to see Edward's face uh, remains unclear. On the 21st of October, 1327, Edward's body was moved from Barclay to Gloucester in a procession and was laid in state at the Abbey. No expense was spared in decorating the hearse on which his body lay. Uh, it was decorated with images of the four evangelists, leopards and angels and so on, while oak barriers were constructed to keep the, the crowds at bay. I can imagine that a lot of people were very curious to see the dead king. You know, dead kings aren't something that, that happen very often. And it does seem that Edward's face was covered while he was lying in state and also that his body was. So because a few, years, um, a few years ago, the historian Enz Kantorovich wrote in his book, The King's Two Bodies, that Edward II's lying in state and funeral was the first time that a life-sized effigy was used uh, in royal funeral in Western European history. Not all that much is known about Edward II's funeral on the 20th of December, 1327, except that it cost 351 pounds, which in modern terms would run into probably many hundreds of thousands. 
Edward III was certainly there, who's now 15 years old with his mother, Queen Isabella. We know that Edward II's half-brother, the Earl of Kent, was there, and no doubt other members of the English royal family were there, uh, with members of the English nobility and the episcopate, however many of them have been able to make that difficult journey to Gloucester in the dead of winter. Roger Mortimer of Wigmore was also there and had had himself a new black tunic made for the occasion. Three years later, Edward III had Roger dragged to his execution wearing that tunic. So at the end of 1327, the disgraced former king was dead and his story was over, or so it seemed. Three years later in October 1330, at not quite 18 years old, Edward III overthrew his mother, Queen Isabella, and Roger Mortimer, and had Roger hanged at, at Tyburn. He, then, he thereafter took over the governance of his own realm. At the Parliament held in late 1330, which condemned Roger Mortimer to death, one of the 14 charges against him was having had Edward II killed, but how he was killed, Edward III didn't explain. Some of the men who had been involved in it fled abroad. William Ockley, uh, the man-at-arms whom... Uh, Roger Mortimer had sent to Barclay Castle with news of the Welsh plot fled, and so did Thomas Gurney, the Knight of Somerset. He was actually the one who had taken Lord Barclay's letters to Edward III in Lincoln, explaining that his father was dead. And these two, William Ockley and Thomas Gurney, were the men whom Edward III actually accused uh, of killing his father, but be, they were sentenced to death in absentia and were never questioned uh, about the murder. <clears throat> Thomas Lord Barclay did not flee, and he appeared before this parliament. When he was asked how he wished to acquit himself of the death of the former king in his custody, Lord Barclay said something rather odd. <laughs> he wishes to acquit himself of the death of the same king, and says that he was never an accomplice, a helper, or procurer in his death, nor did he ever know of his, of his death until the present parliament. Now, it was certainly Lord Barclay who sent Thomas Gurney to Edward III in Lincoln with news of his father's death. So for him to say this three years later does seem rather odd, although we should, of course, bear in mind that this, as, as you can see on the slide, was recorded in Latin in the roles of Parliament, whereas Lord Barclay would almost certainly have spoken in French. Barclay also claimed that he'd been seriously ill on the night of Edward's death and therefore that he couldn't remember anything and wasn't even at the castle anyway, uh, even though he was the one who informed the young king, Edward III, of his father's death. So this is a, a seeming oddity in, in the narrative of Edward II's death or, or murder. And another one is that Edward's half-brother, Edmund, Earl of Kent, the youngest son of Edward I, was beheaded for treason in March 1330. Edmund admitted to believing that his half-brother was still alive at that time, over two years after his funeral, and that he was attempting to free him. According to the Brute Chronicle, the Earl of Kent wrote Edward II a letter, uh, sometime probably in 1329 or early 1330. And we can see some extracts from it here. Sir Knight, worshipful and dear brother, I shall ordain for you that soon you shall come out of prison, so you shall be king again as you were before. So the Brew Chronicle was written in Middle English, but uh, Kent's letter would certainly have been written in French in, in the original. So yes, here's the Earl of Kent in 1330, saying that he would free his supposedly dead half-brother uh, and make him king again. And for this, Kent was beheaded for treason in Winchester on the 19th of March, 1330. He was only 28 years old. So he was 17 years younger than his half-brother. And according to the Brute Chronicle, although the Earl of Kent's confession as recorded in the Chronicle of Adam Murimuth doesn't mention it, Kent believed that Edward was being held in captivity in 1330 at Corfe Castle in Dorset, which is about 100 miles from Barclay Castle. And this is a good excuse to show you a picture of Corfe Castle in Dorset because it's one of the most picturesque and amazing places imaginable, I think. It is possible, though by no means certain, that Edward II actually was at Corfe Castle at some point in 1327. There are quite strong associations with him and the castle. For example, the Brute Chronicle actually thought that Edward was killed at Corfe Castle. Sir John Maltravers, who was Edward's joint custodian in 1327, came from this area 
and in September 1327, were said to be on the services of the king's father, meaning Edward II, uh, somewhere in or, or, or near Corfe. On the other hand, Corfe Castle is pretty well one of the last places that Edward II would have chosen to flee to uh, if he wasn't actually dead in September 1327, basically because John Maltravers, one of his custodians and one of his enemies, uh, was, uh, was very strong in that area. So historians have often sought to, um, to explain the Earl of Kent's plot of 1313, his belief in his former, in his brother, the former king's survival, even though he'd attended his funeral, uh, by claiming that Kent was stupid and gullible and emotionally unstable. I mean, he actually wasn't any of those things. And uh, his changes of allegiance make perfect sense during, uh, in the turbulent context of, of the late in Edward II's reign and its aftermath. And other people whose careers followed a similar trajectory are often praised for their political astuteness, you know, not condemned as, as unstable stable. And if nothing else, Kent's plot does seem to imply that even Edward II's close family didn't have a chance to see his face before he was buried and didn't have a chance to identify him. There certainly were rumours throughout England and Wales in 1330 that Edward II was still alive and people were being arrested for saying so. And some of the English chronicles of the time do comment on the rumours of Edward's survival, though I should point out that all the 14th century English chroniclers say that Edward died in 1327, even if they didn't know how. None of them gave the stories of his survival any credence, if they even bothered to mention them at all. And the Earl of Kent's plot has also often been discussed as though Kent acted more or less alone. But in an article I wrote for the English Historical Review a few years ago, I identified around 70 people who certainly took part in his plot. Many of these people were imprisoned and their lands and goods were confiscated while others fled abroad. Um, some, of these, some of the men who, who took part in this plot were quite important men of the realm, lords and sheriffs, for example. The Archbishop of York was one, and I'll, I'll come to him in a minute. The Bishop and Mayor of London were also involved, as were some of the remnants of the Welsh plotters who had tried to free Edward from Berkeley in September 1327. And many others were low ranking former members of Edward II's household when he'd been king. So were some of the men who had worked alongside him most closely, most closely and knew him very well. Some of Kent's plotters, uh, fellow plotters, such as Lord Beaumont and Lord Wake, were former opponents of Edward II, uh, and had played some kind of role in his downfall. So perhaps in their case, at, at least, uh, their joining the plot was more of an attempt to strike against the regime of Queen Isabella and Roger Mortimer, which is proving as disastrous as the one it had replaced, rather than because they genuinely believed that Edward II was alive and they wanted to help him. Of course, it's impossible to know people's motives for sure, but it, it, gen it does seem that, that the Earl of Kent and at least some of his adherents in 1330 genuinely believed that Edward II was still alive years after his death and funeral and acted to free him. And they took a great risk in doing so. You know, Kent died for it. Others were imprisoned and lost their income for a few months or had to live in exile uh, until Edward III took over the governance of, of his own kingdom. In some cases, their families were also held under house arrest uh, for a few months. And it's also impossible to say for sure why Kent was so convinced that his half-brother was still alive in 1330. And it seems that he covered up his real source. So in his confession, at least ac according to the chronicler Adam Murimuth, although the record of this parliament doesn't survive, uh, Kent said that he'd heard of uh, Edward II's survival from a friar who raised a demon who told him Edward was alive. I mean, this is just a, a nonsense story, and it's impossible that Kent's adherents, and especially the religious ones, would have followed him into treason and perhaps even execution on the basis of a demon-raising friar. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely mad. And weeks after the Earl of Kent's execution, the sheriffs of 17 counties were still being ordered to search for and arrest his remaining adherents. And they were believed to be especially numerous in East Anglia, Hampshire and Wales. I should also point out at this stage uh, that the important men of the realm who didn't join the Earl of Kent's plot, even though they might have been expected to, such as Kent's own brother, the Earl of Norfolk, who was Edward II's other half-brother, their cousin, the Earl of Lancaster, and the Earl of Surrey, who was married to one of Edward II's nieces and had mostly been one of Edward's allies during his reign. And now we come to another oddity, uh, a letter sent on the 14th of January, 1330, by the Archbishop of York and addressed to the Mayor of London, Simon Swanland. Uh, 
It was first discovered and printed in 1911, uh, but the author obviously didn't realize the significance of, of what he discovered, and neither did anyone else until almost a century later. So on the 14th of January, 1330, the Archbishop of York told his kinsman, the mayor of London, that we have certain news of our liege lord, Edward of Carnarvon, that he is alive and in good physical health. So this, of course, was over two years after Edward II's funeral, which is it's probable, though not certain, that uh, the Archbishop actually attended in person. So the Archbishop of York was William Melton, who came from a fairly humble background in Yorkshire and served as Archbishop of York from 1317 to 1340. He'd known Edward II since Edward was 12 or probably even younger than that, and was mostly his ally and staunch supporter, though he was by no means merely a yes man. For example, in 1324, Edward II was persecuting the Bishop of Hereford, Adam Alton, on the grounds that Bishop Alton had supported Roger Mortimer against him some years earlier. Archbishop Melton took Bishop Alton under his protection and basically told the king to back off him, which Edward II actually did. So William Melton was highly thought of in his own lifetime as a, and ever since as a pious and generous man who would often forgive debts to him from the poor if repaying them would pay hardship. And chroniclers wrote that although he was a courtier, he remained uncorrupted by court life and was an honourable man. Melton was one of the few men who spoke out for Edward II during his uh, forced abdication in early 1327, which even Edward II's own half-brothers, the Earls of Norfolk and Kent, didn't do. Uh, they supported Queen Isabella and Roger Mortimer. So Melton's letter is, is quite long, as, as you can see. So after he says that Edward II was alive and well, or that he had news that Edward II was alive and well, he asked uh, the mayor, Simon Swanland, who was a draper by profession, if he could procure clothing, boots, and riding equipment for the former king, as well as 200 pounds in cash, uh, which again would run into several hundreds of thousands nowadays. Melton didn't say in the letter where he thought Edward II was still being held in captivity, but it's clear from the letter that his messenger to uh, Simon Swanland, a man called William Cliff, was also going to inform Swanland of, of other things um, orally. Melton sent another messenger to Scotland to Donald, Earl of Mar, who was an old friend and ally of Edward II, and had been involved in the plots to free Edward from Barclay Castle in 1327. And Mar said that he would bring an army to England to help bring about Edward's release. <clears throat> According to a court case from around this time, and although this is, you know, kind of basically fourth hand information and might not be accurate, William Melton's informant on the matter of Edward II's survival was a man called William Kingsclear. And it's interesting, therefore, to note that Kingsclear was arrested in 1332 for some kind of complicity in Edward II's murder. So that, you know, the whole case just gets murkier and murkier. <clears throat> Melton's letter does seem to show that he genuinely believed Edward II was alive in 1330, or at least, uh, you know, at least when he sent this letter. And he said that he was joyous about it. And although we don't know what had convinced him that Edward was alive, he was, after all, an archbishop in his 50s who'd reached his high position entirely on merit, and like many of the other bishops and archbishops in 14th century England, who were pretty well just the younger sons of the nobility, uh, and their appointment had a lot to do with, uh, with nepotism and good connections. And Melton was a former and future treasurer of England as well, and was certainly not a stupid, gullible or, or inexperienced man. So I've seen it argued that he and the Earl of Kent were perhaps guilty of wishful thinking, wanting Edward II to still be alive. And also that the Earl of Kent perhaps felt guilt over not supporting his half-brother in 1326-27, and therefore pretended that Edward was alive. I mean, I have to admit that I'm not really quite sure how this logic works, how, you know, wanting someone to still be alive means that you go around pretending that they are alive, especially when that person is the former King of England, you know, when, when, with all that that entails. And it's also clear that, at least at this point when he wrote the letter, William Melton was not trying to incite a rebellion against the ruling pair, Queen Isabella and Roger Mortimer, because he told Simon Swanland in the, in the letter not to tell any man or woman of the world about the news that he just imparted to them. <laughs> the letter, of course, isn't proof that Edward II was actually alive in 1330. It's only proof that uh, the Archbishop of York thought that he was. But given who Melton was, uh, we might think that perhaps his, his word carries a, a certain amount of weight on the subject. 
And another letter was discovered in an archive in Montpellier in uh, France in the 1870s. It's called the Fieschi letter. It was written sometime around 1336 or 1338 by a man called Manuel Fieschi and was addressed to Edward III. Manuel Fieschi was to become Bishop of Vercelli, uh, a town near Milan in 1343. And his family, the Fieschis, were the Lords of Genoa and one of the most important and powerful families in Northern Italy in the 13th and 14th centuries, in both the secular and the religious world. So two Fieschi men served as Pope in the late 13th century. And some of the family were actually related to the English royal family. Manuel himself wasn't, but some of his cousins, uh, including Luca Fieschi, a cardinal, were acknowledged as kinsmen by Edward II and his father, Edward I. So Manuel Fieschi's letter begins by suggesting that he's met Edward II in Italy, you know, many years after his supposed death. He then gives an account of Edward II's movements and his capture in late 1326 that seems pretty accurate, or at least mostly accurate, from what we know from other histor historical sources. And he then relates Edward's uh, downfall and subsequent captivity at Barclay Castle, though without mentioning Edward's temporary liberation by the Don Heve gang in July 1327. So, so far, so good. The letter seems, in, you know, in some ways plausible and convincing, but then it all, unfortunately it all starts to go slightly bonkers and claims that Edward II escaped from Barclay Castle uh, with the help of, a, of an unnamed keeper who was looking after him and uh, helped him to escape because two men were coming to murder him. So the keeper gives Edward uh, some, some clothes to put on. Uh, and then the letter claims that members of the Barclay Castle garrison actually saw Edward wandering around the, the corridors of the castle, but didn't recognize him because he was in different clothes. And then Edward escapes from uh, the castle by the simple expedient of killing a porter uh, who's actually asleep. Uh, so this all just seems bizarre and rather implausible. And then the, and what's even more strange is that this porter is then, according to the Fieschi letter, buried in Gloucester as Edward II, and it's his heart that's sent to Queen Isabella as her husband. So this can't be proved or, or not or disproved, but this part of the Fieschi letter at least is implausible, to say the least. Edward II was a famously tall and enormously strong and physical, power, powerfully, powerful man. And it seems unlikely that a humble castle porter would just happen to have this, this same physique. It also seems highly implausible that members of the Barclay Castle garrison wouldn't recognize him just because he was walking around wearing different clothes. <laughs> Fieschi's letter then states that Edward went to Corfe Castle in Dorset, and, and again, it is unlikely that Edward II, if he'd been operating under his own agency, would have actually gone to Corfe Castle, of all places, to the stronghold of his enemies. Um, it would have made far more sense for him to head to Wales, where he must have known that he had plenty of survivor, um, plenty of supporters. Sorry. And then the letter says that uh, Edward was welcomed at Corf Castle by a man called Sir Thomas, custodian of the castle. And the problem is that there actually was no Sir Thomas, who was the custodian of Corf Castle at this time. The letter continues that Edward II stayed at Corf for a year and a half uh, until the Earl of Kent's execution, which is a chronological error, possibly Manuel Fieschi's own error. It should actually be two and a half years from September 1327 to March 1330. And then Edward II goes to Ireland, according to the letter, which again seems a really odd choice. Although Edward had been uh, Lord of Ireland during his reign as King of England, he'd never actually set foot in Ireland, whereas Roger Mortimer had spent a large part of his career there and was an important lord and landowner in Ireland. The letter says that Edward spends nine months in Ireland, which would take us up roughly to the execution of Roger Mortimer in late 1330, although that isn't actually mentioned in the letter. And then, according to Manuel Fieschi, Edward leaves Ireland because he feared that he'd be recognised, which seems bizarre, because why would he start worrying after nine months about being recognised in a country that Edward II had never set foot in? And then what's even more bizarre is that the letter says Edward subsequently takes a ship to Sandwich in Kent, where for some reason he isn't bothered about being recognised, even though Edward II spent his entire life in England. So this part of the Fieschi letter fails to convince, uh, to put it mildly. And from Sandwich, says the letter, Edward sails to the continent and travels down through Fa France to Avignon, where he spends 15 days with Pope John XXII. 
Edward II and Pope John XXII had often communicated, but to my knowledge, they never actually met in person. And although there certainly were plenty of people at the papal court who had met Edward II in person and would have known exactly what he looked like, uh, the Fieschi letter says that Pope John kept Edward at Avignon secretly and honorably. So it's not even clear if anyone else actually knew that he was there. From Avignon, Edward travels back north to Brabant, which is now in uh, Belgium. And that actually does make sense because the Duke of Brabant at the time was Edward II's own nephew and Edward's sister Margaret, the Dowager, du the Dowager Duchess of Brabant, was still alive. The Earl of Kent's confession also mentions the Duke of Brabant. From Brabant, Edward travels by a Cologne all the way down to Milan. And the letter says that he ended up at a place that can be identified as the hermitage of Sant'Alberto di Butrio in Lombardy. So you can see here on a map um, <clears throat> that there's the, there's the hermitage of Sant'Alberto with Milan to the north and Genoa to the south. And then over here is Vercelli. That's where Manuel Fieschi uh, became bishop in 1343. And there's no doubt that this was a part of Italy that was dominated by Manuel's Fies uh, family, the Fieschis, and by their relatives, the Malaspina family. And here are some pictures of the hermitage of Sant'Alberto di Butrio, which is still there. It's still in use as a hermitage. Um, so I, I visited a few years ago. It's a, a really lovely and, and very uh, tranquil place. And then the Fieschi letter ends by stating that Edward, lived, Edward II, the former king, lived a life of prayer at Sant'Alberto. And it's not actually clear from, from Manuel's letter whether Edward was actually still alive at the time that Manuel wrote it, um, about nine or 11 years after Edward's death. So what are we to make of the Fieschi letter? It's generated an awful lot of debate and puzzlement in the 150 years since it was discovered. We have no other evidence that Edward II ever went anywhere near Italy, and certainly not 10 years after his official death. Um, though there are a group of people in Italy, friends of mine called the Oromala Project, who are searching through Italian archives, hoping that we might find some document that might go some way to confirming that Edward II was actually there at some point. And I might point out at this stage that in Northern Italy, a lot of children hear a folk tale uh, of an English king who fled to Italy and died there. And although no one ever has any idea what this man's name was or which king it was or even what century he, he lived in, the story certainly goes back well before the 20th century. I've given talks about Edward II in Italy and I've had plenty of Italians telling me to my face that they too heard the story in childhood of this mysterious English king who fled to Italy. So why would an Italian man of noble birth, who was a, a notary of the Pope and later became a bishop, tell the King of England that his father was alive a, a good decade after his death? Did Manuel Fieschi really believe that he'd met Edward II? And if he didn't, what was his motive in telling Edward III that he had met his father? I've seen blackmail suggested as, as uh, Manuel's motive, but I'm not really quite sure how, how blackmail would work. There wouldn't be any leverage if anyone knew that Edward II was dead and buried in Gloucester. And I'm also not really quite sure why a man who came from one of the most powerful families in medieval England, uh, medieval Italy, sorry, uh, would have needed to blackmail the King of England anyway. And as to how Edward III might have reacted to, to the letter, assuming that he ever received it, we, we can't possibly know because no copy of the letter has ever been found in England. It just exists in one copy uh, in an archive in Montpellier. <clears throat> so this is another major oddity or anomaly in the narrative of Edward II's death, which even after a century and a half can't really be explained satisfactorily. And there's just one final oddity I'd like to tell you about, uh, which concerns a man called William the Welshman. And um, please bear in mind here that Edward II was born in Wales and that he was the first heir to the English throne to be made Prince of Wales in 1301. When it... <clears throat> When Edward III was in Koblenz in Germany in September 1338, 11 years after his father's death, his household accounts record that he met a man called William the Welshman, who says he is the king's father. William the Welshman was taken to Edward III by an Italian sergeant at arms called Francesco Fossetti and spent some time with the king. So royal pretenders or imposters weren't particularly common, but they did, they did uh, arise every once in a while. So back in 1318, Edward II himself had confronted a man called John Daedras, 
who claimed to be the real son of Edward I, and therefore the rightful King of England, and claimed that Edward II was an imposter. Because this involved an active claim to the throne of England, John Daedras was executed. But on the other hand, five years earlier, in 1313, Edward II had met another man called Richard Newby, who claimed to be Edward's brother. And because uh, Newby didn't demand anything from Edward uh, and didn't claim to be the rightful king of England, he wasn't executed. He just simply received some money from Edward and then vanishes from history. So to me, it's not all that surprising that Edward III might have been curious enough to meet a man who claimed to be his dead father 11 years after Edward II's death. And it's not even necessarily all that surprising that William, Wel William the Welshman wasn't executed if he didn't actually try to claim the English throne. But what is surprising to me is the time and the place of this meeting. So in 1337, Edward III had claimed the throne of France. And he spent much of the period from 1338 to 1340 outside England, seeking allies against the French. So the reason he was in Koblenz in September 1338 was to meet the Holy Roman Emperor, Ludwig of Bavaria, and other leaders of Germany, hoping to persuade them to ally with him against Philip VI of France. Now, these were some of the most important and far-reaching negotiations of Edward III's entire 50-year reign. And right in the middle of this, he had this man, William the Welshman, who says he is the king's father, brought to him in Koblenz. In 1338, the town of Koblenz was ruled by a man called Baldwin of, Luxem Baldwin of Luxembourg, Archbishop of Trier, who was the brother of the previous Holy Roman Emperor and was one of the most powerful politicians in Germany. And as Edward III met William the Welshman in Baldwin's own town, Baldwin must certainly have heard about it. And if he knew about it, then so did the emperor, Ludwig. I mean, this is quite weird to me. This is like, you know, if Rishi Sunak flies off to the US to meet Joe Biden and in the middle of some very tense and delicate negotiations suddenly says, oh, you don't mind if this bloke tags along with me, do you? Only he says he's my dad. You know? We buried my dad a decade ago, but this bloke is adamant that it's him. You know, it's just very weird. The King of England, of all people, could have had an imposter brought to him in a hundred different places at a hundred different times. So why in Koblenz at that exact time of his reign? That's what I find interesting. Not so much that someone might claim to be the dead King of England, or even that Edward III would be willing to meet him, but that Edward III had this person brought to him uh, in, this, in the middle of this very important period in, in his reign and on the most public stage imaginable. So that's a fairly quick run through of the main anomalies in the narrative of Edward II's death. And after William the Welshman in 1338 and the Fieschi letter, which was written around the same time or a year or two earlier, there's no more evidence relating to the possible survival of the former king. It is notable that with the exception of Manuel Fieschi, who does seem to have met a man he thought was Edward in Italy, none of the people who believed in Edward's survival after 1327 actually claimed to have seen him in person. You know, they, they received this information from other people. So this is in fact secondhand information. And I think, you know, this is surely significant. But then on the other hand, all of the many English chroniclers who said that Edward died in 1327 didn't see his dead body. And they certainly weren't present in the room when Edward died uh, or was murdered. So that's secondhand information as well. And as we saw earlier in the talk, Edward III sent a letter to his cousin, the Earl of Hereford, just three days after his father's murder, and he was 150 miles away. So there's no possible way that the young king could have traveled to Berkeley to, to see his father's uh, dead body for, him, for himself. He hadn't even had time to send men there to verify the information for him. So he started disseminating the news of his father's death, uh, basically on the basis of Lord Berkeley's letter, which he couldn't actually have verified. So what I wonder is who actually saw Edward II dead in September 1327? Lord Berkeley surely must have done because Edward died in his own castle. But then three years later, Lord Berkeley made that peculiar statement to Parliament that he hadn't known of Edward's death until he arrived at the Parliament. And even if we interpret Berkeley's statement as meaning that he didn't know Edward II had been murdered or he didn't know anything about the circumstances of Edward's death, isn't that also a bit odd? I mean, I don't know about you, but I think that if a former king died in my home when I was legally responsible for him, even if I had nothing to do with his death, I think I might try to figure out what had happened at some point over the next three years. And someone who, of course, did see the body in 1327 was the unnamed local woman who carried out the embalming. Uh, but 
would a woman of her status ever actually have seen the former king in person? Would she have known what Edward II looks like? There are also the men who, according to the chronicler Adam Murimoth, uh, saw Edward's body, but superficially, the, the knights, abbots, and burgesses of Bristol and Gloucester. So did they see his face? Another man who must have seen the body was William Beaucaire, the sergeant at arms, who guarded Edward's body for a month after his death. Uh, but uh, just a few months earlier, he'd been closely associated with some of Edward's chief supporters, who were shortly afterwards to free Edward from captivity at Barclay Castle. And William Ockley and Thomas Gurney, the men whom Edward III actually accused of killing his father, they must surely have seen Edward II dead as well, but they fled abroad uh, when they were sentenced to death for the king's murder and were never questioned on the matter. So did Edward III, did Edward III even know how his father had been murdered? Uh, I mean, that would also have been second-hand information, surely. And the Earl of Kent's plot in 1329-1330 does seem to show that neither he nor any of his close family actually saw Edward's face before he was buried. I mean, it doesn't seem very likely that Kent would have committed treason and made elaborate plans to free Edward II from captivity if he'd actually had a chance to see his face and identify him. I mean, it may be perhaps that in 1327, Edward II's face was covered at least partly uh, because there would have been visible signs that he'd been murdered uh, on his face uh, at the time when his death was, was, was being presented as, as coming of natural causes. But then this inadvertently led some of Edward's supporters later into believing or suspecting that, that he wasn't dead after all. And when we look at Roger Mortimer of Wigmore, who between 1327 and 1330 was certainly the co-ruler of England with Queen Isabella, uh, while Edward III was still underage, Ed Roger certainly had every motive to want Edward II dead. If Edward was ever freed and if he ever got the chance, uh, he would certainly subject Roger uh, to a terrible death by drawing, hanging and quartering, and he would punish his family as well. So Roger Mortimer was charged with Edward II's murder in late 1330, but it was, one of only, it was only one of 14 charges against him. And we should bear in mind that a motive to kill, or even a strong motive to kill, isn't actually evidence of killing. And that some of Roger Mortimer's contemporaries, such as the Earl of uh, Kent and the Archbishop of York, did actually believe, at least for a while, that Roger hadn't had Edward II killed. And when it comes to Queen Isabella, things get a bit more complex. Edward II was, after all, her husband and the father of her children. And for those reasons, uh, she might not have wanted Edward dead at all. Uh, the assumption that Queen Isabella hated Edward and wanted him dead is an assumption, and it might not be true. It might be, it might not be. We, we, we don't know what Isabella was feeling in 1327. And then, of course, uh, Queen Isabella knew better than anyone how vengeful and vindictive her husband could be. And if he ever got the chance, he would certainly punish her as well, especially after she had had his uh, beloved favourite and Chamberlain, Hugh de Spencer the Younger, subjected to the traitor's death in November 1326. So perhaps the answer to this mystery is, after all, the most obvious one. Roger Mortimer of Wigmore ordered the murder of Edward, the, Edward II with the acquiescence, reluctant or otherwise, of Queen Isabella. Edward II certainly never appeared in public again after he was moved to Barclay Castle in April 1327. He never walked into Parliament and went, oh, look, here I am. And as I pointed out, uh, the idea that he would have gone to Corfe Castle in Dorset and to Ireland of all places if he escaped is not consistent with the way Edward II would certainly have behaved if he'd been operating under his own agency and making his own decisions. Edward is far more likely to have gone to Wales, uh, perhaps even to Amesbury Priory in Wiltshire, where his sister Mary was a nun and lived until 1332. Or he might have gone to the continent to, to Brabant, where his other sister Margaret, the Dowager, Dowager Duchess, uh, was still alive. Could we perhaps construct some kind of narrative where Edward II was presented as dead in September 1327, while he was actually still alive, to put a stop to the plots to free him while not actually committing regicide and the murder of Queen Isabella's husband? And then thereafter, Edward was secretly kept alive by Roger Mortimer and his associates, Thomas Barclay and John Maltravers, so that when the Archbishop of York and the Earl of Kent thought that Edward was alive in 1330, Maybe he actually still was. 
But one problem with this scenario is that someone was definitely buried in Gloucester in December 1327. And the problem with assuming that another man might have stood in, as it were, for Edward II's dead body is actually Edward II's own physique. So numerous English chroniclers of the 14th century comment on Edward II's height and his enormous physical strength. One chronicler says that he was one of the strongest men in his realm. And the Scottish poet says that Edward II was the strongest man that you might find in any country. So where was anyone going to find another man with that kind of physique? Certainly not a humble castle porter, you would, you would have to imagine. Um, Edward II's coffin in Gloucester Abbey, his, uh, Gloucester Cathedral, sorry, has never actually been opened, incidentally. Uh, his tomb was opened in 1855 and his coffin was seen, uh, but not opened. So maybe someday, if, if permission is ever forthcoming to open the coffin, maybe we'll get some kind of answers to at least some of the mystery. And how do we fit the Fieschi letter into the narrative? Its account of Edward II's last months of freedom seems uh, accurate from what we know, uh, but its account of, his, of Edward's escape from Berkeley just seems actually quite bonkers, to put it mildly. And the way the letter addresses Edward III is quite strange. It comes across as very rude, uh, not the way that we would expect a lawyer at the papal court to address a king of all people. And some, some people believe that the Latin of the letter isn't consistent with the standard we would expect from a man who was a lawyer at the papal court. But the letter does always refer to the man in Italy as your father, meaning Edward III's father. It never says the man claiming to be your father or the man who says he is your father. So it doesn't seem like Manuel Fieschi, uh, assuming that he was the one who wrote the letter uh, and didn't just have his name put to it to, to give it uh, plausibility, did actually believe that he'd met Edward II. He wasn't, in, he wasn't warning Edward III of a man going around Italy say, saying that he was his father. So to sum up, there's uh, much evidence that Edward II died at Barclay Castle in September 1327, but there's also quite a bit of evidence that he didn't, or at the very least that a lot of people uh, who'd known him very well believed that he didn't die at Barclay Castle. And of course, these two positions cannot be reconciled. And even assuming that Edward II did die in September 1327, we can ponder what persuaded so many influential people to believe that he didn't and to act on that belief to the point of being executed and arrested, imprisoned, uh, thrown into exile. <clears throat> and I think this in itself is rather fascinating. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've given you something to mull over this morning, and I do hope that you'll be interested enough to do some uh, more reading on, on the subject uh, later and see what you think of it. You know, I'd be really interested to know what side of the argument you fall on. So Edward II's reign, to me, is the most fascinating, dramatic, and turbulent era in English history, and its ending and its aftermath proved equally dramatic and fascinating. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, indeed, I think you've uh, given us a great deal to mull over. Uh, I think I always think that one of the fascinating aspects of study of medieval history is that there is a, a certain amount that we can be fairly confident uh, of knowing, uh, but also quite significant amounts uh, that we don't know. Uh, and we have to accept that we don't know but it's fascinating to research and to study and to explore uh, and to look at what evidence there is and what conclusions can be drawn. And so I think you have very clearly uh, set out for us the evidence uh, for both for the death of Edward II at Berkeley or the survival. And as you say, people can assess that evidence and draw their own conclusions. Uh, which you invited people to do. So we have got a couple of minutes. Uh, if people would like to ask any questions of, to Catherine or indeed make any comments, uh, give their views. Uh, people at home, uh, you can submit questions on the chat. Uh, Clive is uh, in the auditorium uh, and can help read out uh, your questions. Are you indicating, Clive, that there is a question? A whole right. Well, okay. We'll have we'll have to be selective then. <laughs> um, if 
if Alistair um, isn't able to, and I should just say that Alistair has emailed me again to ask me to give everybody his apologies. Uh, he's really sorry to have let us down that he hasn't been able to join us this morning. He's still hopeful he might be able to recover in time for this afternoon. But as I said, I think uh, if Alistair can't join us, then the final slot this afternoon can be an opportunity for a panel discussion and more questions. So there will possibly be time later. Uh, but Clive, can you read out one of the questions? Um, the first one that came through <coughs> has partly all answered, but have the remains in Gloucester Cathedral ever been scientifically examined? Sorry, Edward, the second remains. Remains, yes. Uh, no, unfortunately, no. Um, the tomb was only opened in 1855, and then the coffin wasn't actually examined. So no one's actually seen the remains until uh, the funeral in December 1327, uh, unfortunately. So I think, you know, it, you know, maybe it would be great if, if sometime if we, we could get permission to actually open the coffin but, uh, and actually examine the remains and, you know, with, with modern technology and scientific knowledge, obviously. But of course, I think it is very difficult nowadays to get permission to, to open up tombs um, just to, to satisfy curiosity. So, yeah, so unfortunately, I'm not sure that we'll ever actually be able to, to solve the mystery by, by looking at uh, the remains in, in Gloucester Cathedral. Okay, is there any, anybody in the auditorium? Who would like to make it right? Okay, some hands have immediately gone up. <laughs> I'll come to this lady over here first. Catherine, what, what do you make of the fact that Edward III, well, Edward II, didn't give up his title, the Prince of Wales? It was the one title he didn't give up. And then it was only later in 1340s that Edward III used it. Yes. Um, so this is a this is one of Ian Mortimer's uh, ideas that uh, Edward II was the King of England, Lord of Ireland, Duke of Aquitaine, Prince of Wales, Earl of Chester, and Count of Pontier, and he gave up five of those titles to his son. But the one he never actually uh, gave up was Prince of Wales. The future Edward III was never actually made Prince of Wales, and the next Prince of Wales after Edward II was his grandson, who's known as the Black Prince, the eldest son of Edward III and grandfather and uh, father of of uh, Richard II. Um, so, uh, yes, I think, you know, Ian, Ian Mortimer certainly thinks that, that this um, indicates that perhaps William the Welshman might have been Edward II because he was still perhaps officially uh, the Prince of Wales. But, you know, I, I mean, for myself, I think the fact that Edward was born in North Wales and, you know, was always called Edward of Carnarvon in his own lifetime is, is also yeah, quite significant as well, perhaps. Could you tell us a bit more about the Fieschi letter? Is it um, absolutely contemporary? Oh, was it a copy and, and what kind of language? It was, it yes, it was, it was copied into the cartulary of, of the bishops of Magalon, which is how it actually ended up being in Montpellier in, in the first place. So um, I think people who are, you know, um, experts on handwriting and, and, the, and Latin and that kind of thing, they, that they do be, strongly believe that it is actually contemporary to, to the 1330s or, or thereabouts. Um, so I don't think it's believed to be a fake in that sense and that it was just copied in, you know, centuries later. Um, but as I point, you know, as I, I pointed out, there are some issues with it, and one of the issues is that this the standard of, of Latin and the way it addresses Edward III is, yeah, it's a, perhaps a bit too casual for for a papal lawyer who is addressing uh, the King of England. So there is a theory that perhaps it's not fake in the sense that it was written centuries later, but that it was kind of forged by someone else for reasons unknown, person and persons unknown, and had Manuel Fieschi's name put to it uh, to give it a kind of plausible ability because of who Manuel actually was so yeah it's it's a real mystery the Fieschi letter yeah there's there's all kinds of you know of like you know theories and, and debates about it but I think no one's ever really come up with like the one solution like it means this you know and it was definitely written here for this purpose you know so it's 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 fascinating to to consider I think yeah. right we'll, we'll take one more question from uh, the on, online questions and then, then we'll need to move on um was Archbishop Melton punished in any way by Edward III after the Kent plot? Um, so during 
Roger Mortimer and Isabella's regime, uh, the archbishop was actually put on trial in front of King's Bench on a charge of treason, basically because he'd invited Donald of Mar to come to England. And so uh, Mar said that he would bring an army. So therefore, Melton had committed treason by inviting a foreign army to England. But rather strangely, he was, he was actually acquitted. Uh, and then a few months later, uh, very shortly after uh, Edward III overthrew his mother and Queen Isabella, he reappointed William Melton as, as the treasurer of England. Uh, so it certainly doesn't seem that he was angry with him uh, in any way for, for believing that Edward II had still been alive. Okay, we'll just fit in one last question. <laughs> uh, you've obviously been to the Hermitage, I think you said. Yes. And there's obviously nobody there. You would think it might have been quite good business for them to get pilgrims. Funnily enough, yeah, there is actually a tomb um, at the Hermitage of Santa. Unfortunately, I didn't really have to have the time to mention it, but there is a tomb there which they claim to be Edward II, but it's empty. So they are, I think they do try and, yeah, kind of yeah, bring in, you know, visitors maybe by the dead king of England who fled here, you know, but there's, there's not, not, not actually any remains in the tomb. And I suppose just if we think hypothetically that the Fieschi letter is true and Edward was at Sant Alberto and the William of the Welshman story is true and that actually was Edward II in Corblenz, then you see that was September 1338. So therefore at that point, Edward II, whoever it was, was actually in Germany. So then did he ever go back to Sant Alberto anyway to, to be buried there? So again, this is another mystery. He might just have been thrown in a ditch somewhere near Corblenz. <laughs> Okay, right, it's uh, time to move on. So thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, that's been a fascinating talk and certainly has stirred up a lot of conversation and comments. And as I said, there might be an opportunity this afternoon to come back to that. Uh, one thing that I'm aware of is that uh, we do have a number of people attending online uh, in the United States and Canada. So th thank you very much to those people for getting up quite <laughs> early in the morning. Um, certainly for people on the, get my geography right, on the eastern seaboard, then it will have been 5, 5 a.m. Uh, start for you. Uh, and uh, even earlier for the people in the central uh, and western uh, seaboard. Uh, but I think one, um, one reflection uh, on, on your talk, Catherine, mm -hmm. is that um, I'm, I, I should apologise, first of all. Uh, during the first talk, I do have to check my phone uh, because I normally get a, two or three emails from people saying, whoops, I can't join online. I've lost the Zoom code. Uh, could you send it to me? So, I do ha so uh, my apologies that I was looking at my phone a couple of times. Uh, but what I did see... Um, on, uh, on my phone was that uh, one of the uh, people who is uh, attending from the United States immediately joined the society. Oh, uh, excellent. So, uh, Very good. Well, so <laughs> well, welcome to Liz. Uh, but I think that's a tribute to the quality of your talk, Catherine, that it's immediately uh, persuaded somebody to, to join the Mortimer <laughs> History Society. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.